I'm going to be talking today about end-to-end uh, -to -end testing for web applications. Um, so we'll be focusing uh, a lot on the front-end stuff, uh, browser automation, all of that kind of thing. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about uh, why we test code um, and why end-to-end -end tests in particular are important. Um, so many of you will be familiar with uh, this pyramid as a model of um, testing our code. The idea that we have lots of unit tests, um, a slightly smaller number of integration tests, and then a much smaller number of end-to-end -end tests. I actually think this is a slightly dated model, um, because what we care about is not uh, tests, it's code quality, it's reliability, it's bugs in our code. You know, does, our, does our application work? That's ultimately what we're trying to figure out. So this is uh, the approach that I like to take which is to say uh, that we have end-to-end -end tests at the top. Yes, there's a small number of those. Then we have uh, what I like to think of as JavaScript tests in the front-end world, but in the back-end world, that's, that's really any kind of automated testing uh, that you don't consider to be an end-to-end -end test. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean unit tests. It doesn't necessarily mean you're testing one function or one module at a time. Uh, it just means that you're not doing the full gambit from web browser to database. Uh, the key is that these tests are fast uh, and that they're reliable, that if you get a failure in one of those tests, you know that your code has really failed. Um, the downside of using exclusively, uh, or using mainly unit tests to test your code um, is that then because you're only testing one thing at a time, you need a huge number of tests to really know that your code works. And then you need to go and test the whole stuff again with integration tests to check that it works together. And then you're testing the whole thing again with end-to-end -end tests to check that the full story works. Um, so I think you know, slightly fewer levels and layers makes a lot of difference. And then the other thing I've added on the bottom here is static analysis. And static analysis is not necessarily, it was, is not technically testing, um, but it's exactly, it's absolutely in this same uh, gambit the same world of trying to improve the quality of the applications we write, the reliability of the applications we write. Um, so this is correct for how many of these kinds of tests or how much of this kind of testing you should do, uh, but this pyramid idea, I think, can get confused. In terms of importance, it actually looks much more like this. Each of these layers catches similar numbers of bugs and prevents you shipping those bugs to users. So they're similarly important. Uh, it's just that you have an awful lot of static analysis, you have a lot of automated tests, and you have a small number of end-to-end -end tests. So why static analysis? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, why static analysis? So um, the biggest advantage of static analysis is you cover 100% of the code. With end-to-end -end tests, with integration tests, with unit tests, there's always going to be some bits of the code, some parts of the code that you forget to test, that you don't have time to test. Um, the idea of 100% code coverage is a really nice goal to, to kind of aim for when you're starting a greenfield project, but the reality in most modern large web applications is it's completely unrealistic. Uh, there are code paths that can be very hard to hit in tests, uh, but that you know still need to be there. Um, and there can be things, the features that are very rarely used that just don't feel like they're worth writing the tests for. Um, the other thing static analysis gives you is some kind of built-in documentation. Uh, so if you've marked up the types in your code, uh, then at least at a glance you know uh, what arguments a function takes, what that function returns. Um, so it's not documentation as such, and that it doesn't express the intent. Uh, you can't express in, in types what the code does, but at the very least you express what it takes in as its inputs and what it returns as its outputs. Um, it often catches incorrect assumptions, like assuming that something is a string or a number, uh, when in fact it's the other way around. And it catches those assumptions even if the code is never actually run by a test. So tests catch uh, broken assumptions, but uh, static analysis catches those broken assumptions even if the code is never executed. 
Uh, it helps a lot when you're making refactors uh, because it makes things like renaming uh, a method very safe. If you rename a method and you have a type system, your type system will tell you uh, where all of the locations are that you're calling that method with the incorrect name. Now, the downsides of static analysis or, or the limitations of static analysis are that it doesn't actually encode intent. Uh, static analysis can tell you that a function takes a number and returns a number, but it won't tell you that that function doubles the number. To check that that's what happens, you're going to need some kind of a test. Ultimately, they don't actually run the code, and nothing apart from running the code will tell you everything that happens. You know, the, another a classic computer science problem is the halting problem. It's impossible to tell uh, in every case whether a program terminates. Static analysis can warn you of programs that might not terminate, uh, or it could even verify that, you're, that certain programs do terminate. But there's always going to be examples of code that you might know terminates, but that you can't prove with static analysis. At the very least, with an, end -to -end, uh, with an, uh, an automated test or an end-to-end -end test, you can check that given a certain input, that code does what it's supposed to. So how to do static analysis? On the front end, tools like ESLint and uh, TSLint let you run rules against your code that check for mistakes. And I'm sure the same exists for lots of other languages. Um, TypeScript and Flow for your front end add type checking to JavaScript. These are both really similar tools. Um, both of them do a lot of uh, giving, the other, giving the others abuse uh, in terms of their feature sets or functionality. Uh, the reality is that these tools both have very similar uh, levels of quality when it comes to catching bugs. Uh, they're actually very similar designs in terms of the uh, feature set and the languages. Um, there's really not a huge amount to tell between them. So they just do different implementations of the same idea. What you don't want to use any of these tools for, uh, especially things like ESLint and TSLint that get used for these a lot, is checking the formatting of your code. Uh, you know, if you want to check that uh, your code has the right number, of right indentation, uh, the right white space, you've chosen the, the consistent approach of single or double quotes, none of this stuff is actually going to break your application in production. These tools are the wrong kind of tools for that job. Uh, Prettier, on the other hand, is excellent. Anyone that's working with JavaScript or TypeScript, Prettier is something you should start using immediately. Uh, it is a massive time saver. It saves a huge number of uh, potential arguments in your team about how code should be formatted, because it just does it for you. Next, why JavaScript tests or why automated tests uh, that are not full end-to-end -end tests? They're much faster than end-to-end -end tests. They tend to be reliable and consistent. So you know that when these tests fail, your code is broken. They also help to isolate problems. So it's usually the case with any of these kind of level of automated tests that if it's broken, you'll have some kind of a stack trace. You'll know roughly where it's gone wrong. Uh, and you can zero in on what the problem is, and how to go about fixing it. So these help a lot with developer productivity, as well as catching bugs before they go to production. Now, the limitations of this, though, is that it doesn't test the actual platform. You're not testing you know, whether your website works with Internet Explorer, or whether it works with Google Chrome, whether it works with Firefox. You're simply testing, in most examples of JavaScript tests, you're testing whether it works in Node, uh, which is not the environment that any of your users are likely to be using to browse your website. You need a lot of tests of this kind to get good coverage, especially if you start to isolate down to unit tests. Because each test is only covering a few modules, you need many, many tests to cover all of the modules in your code base. It doesn't test the integration between the front end and the back end. I haven't seen any companies with setups where they're uh, unit tests test integration between front and back end code. Um, so for that, you're usually going to want some kind of end-to-end -end test. It also doesn't test what a real user does. You're the real users of your application, unless what, you, what your company is offering is an API, are not sitting there calling individual REST endpoints or, um, you know, or, or calling individual functions in your JavaScript code. <laughs> 
If you want to do automated tests like this, though, and you are doing them for JavaScript, I highly recommend Jest. Jest is by far uh, the best in class at the moment for uh, unit testing and uh, integration kind of level testing of JavaScript applications. Right, on to the good stuff, end-to-end -end tests. So why do we want to do end-to-end -end tests? Uh, they test what a real user would do. They allow us to expose browser inconsistencies. So if we run our, our integration, our end-to-end -end tests in multiple browsers, we can tell if our application is broken in one of those browsers, even if it's not the browser that we as developers use to build our system. A relatively small number of end-to-end -end tests can test a huge part of your system. In fact, even just one end-to-end -end test, if you don't have one already, can add a huge benefit. You can go right from registering as a new user, you know, using the, the key, most important first feature of your application you expect new users to touch, and then you can have that end-to-end that -end test log out, log back in again. At that point, you've tested a vast swathe through your application that is going to be the first impression that new users get. And you can check then that that works across many, many browsers. End-to-end -end tests are really the only way to know that a part of your system is working. If you have an end-to-end -end test that's running every single time you deploy, then you know that the, the flow covered by that end-to-end -end test works in all of the browsers that you run that end-to-end -end test in. And the same is not really true of any other form of automated testing. The limitations of end-to-end -end tests, the reason we don't just do end-to-end -end tests, they are very slow on the whole, although we're going to try and that is something that's improving over time. They can be unreliable, although we'll talk about some of the techniques you can use to slightly reduce that unreliability. Um, and they can be expensive, both in terms of time spent writing them, but also in terms of the machines that you have to provision in order to run these end-to-end -end tests. Um, and the, finally, it can be hard to know what has caused failures. When your end-to-end -end tests go wrong, you don't necessarily know what broke, uh, and it can take a lot more time to actually drill down and debug what, what, what is broken in your application. Now, on that final point, I would say that that's not really the reason for writing end-to-end -end tests. And for that matter, it's not really the reason to write tests at all. Yes, on the whole, tests help you fi figure out what's broken. But actually, they do something far more important than that. They tell you that something is broken. Every time an end-to-end -end test fails, and it's a genuine bug, you know that that's a bug that you would have shipped to production. So if it takes a little extra time to find the bug and actually track it down and fix it, that's not the end of the world. The key is you've got the benefit of having found out about the bug at all. So we're not talking about all of the bugs here. We're hoping that most of the bugs get caught by uh, static analysis or failing that by uh, automated testing at a, at a slightly faster level than the end-to-end -end tests. But we're talking about maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe 30% of the bugs that get caught by our automated systems get caught in end-to-end -end tests. And unfortunately, those might be the slowest and hardest to figure out uh, the fix for. But at least we've got a clear, reliable uh, set of uh, sequence of actions that we know was taken in order to trigger that bug. So hopefully, I have convinced you that end-to-end -end tests are worth doing. Uh, if you want to do them, how do you go about it? How do you go about automating a browser and, and having it run through a flow through your application? Well, there's a technology called WebDriver that makes this uh, relatively easy to do. And the definition of WebDriver says that WebDriver is a remote control interface that enables introspection and control of user agents. It provides a platform and language neutral wire protocol as a way for out of process programs to remotely instruct the behavior of web browsers. And that was a mouthful. So hopefully I haven't lost any of you. Simpler definition, WebDriver is a consistent API for automating browsers. So WebDriver provides a REST API for automatically uh, taking actions that a user would normally take with a web browser. It has a specification. It's properly standardized across all of the browsers. Um, 
so that means that there are multiple API layers you can use and choose from in order to drive your browser, and then you can drive all of the different browsers using the same API. So whichever language you choose to write your tests in, there is almost certainly a dry, uh, an API layer to talk to WebDriver in that language. If you want to do cross-browser testing, by far the easiest way is to use one of these cloud providers. I've personally tried Source Labs, Browser Stack, and Testing Bot, and I haven't tried cross-browser testing yet. But the ones I've tried all provide an almost identical service uh, at an almost identical quality. So I would say, really, if you are going to go down this route, the best option is to choose whichever works out cheapest for the workload you expect to have. Setting up and managing a cloud of different browsers, of different versions on different operating systems is by far the most costly and difficult process of getting started with end-to-end -end testing. So if you do want to test across multiple browsers, unless you're the size of Facebook or Google, I'd highly recommend going this kind of a route. However, these do cost money. If you want a cheaper option, a faster option just to get started, if you can't afford the investment of cross-browser testing, there's still a huge amount of value to be gained from just testing in one browser. And setting up one browser, there are a few different options. Uh, Chrome Driver, which I'll show in a moment, makes it very easy to run tests against Google Chrome locally on your machine. Uh, but there's also an interesting project called JS DOM that's maintained by Dominic Denicola. And JS DOM is a complete implementation of a JavaScript DOM, uh, essentially the, the JavaScript API parts of a web browser in pure JavaScript, so it can run in Node.js. Uh, it even includes things like the Canvas API. Um, but what it doesn't include yet, although it may in the future, is navigation, things like form submission, um, local storage. There's a, there's a few of those kind of things that you would think of as part of a browser that are not included in this. So I've built another project called TaxiRank. TaxiRank wraps JS DOM to turn it into a full browser. So it adds navigation, form submission, uh, and a few other bits and bobs. But the other big thing, and actually the main thing that TaxiRank provides, is that it provides a web driver API onto JS DOM. So this means you can use WebDriver to power tests that are, are running in Node.js as a fake browser, uh, which can be a very fast option for running your tests. Uh, in my tests, it can be 10 to 20% faster than Chrome, uh, although your results may vary. WebDriver, like I said, is a REST-based protocol. There are drivers you can use in uh, an API adapters you can use in most languages. I've personally written and used Cabby, uh, which is a WebDriver API for Node.js. It has a few advantages over the alternatives, um, mainly that it provides both a synchronous and an asynchronous API, which makes your tests quicker and easier to write. Uh, but also, it's very focused on having a small, minimal API. It doesn't aim to be your test runner. You can use Mocha or Jest or whatever your test runner of choice is alongside Cabby. It doesn't aim to be assertion, an assertion library. All, all Cabby aims to be is a library for automating web browsers. So enough talking. Time for a demo. Um, this is uh, going to be a demo of a the tests for a website I built that runs, um, if it's, yeah, that runs, um, that, that's managing, for managing con entries to canoe slalom competitions. So I, I kayak as a hobby, um, kayaking, canoeing, uh, words that are used interchangeably. Um, and we have uh, competitions every few weeks at a weekend. Uh, and this is a system for managing those entries. What you're seeing here is the automated test running. Um, it's running through all of the actions a user would, you, would, would normally run through, clicking on all of the buttons, uh, typing things in. Um, 
But this is running in taxi rank, so this is a fake browser. Uh, we're not able to visually see anything because it's not handling CSS or layout or rendering any page. Um, if we want to, though, we can run it against Chrome driver. And running it against Chrome driver, we'll be able to, we, we only have to, we have to start Chrome driver in a separate tab, first of all. Um, and with Chrome driver running, we can make one simple change to the command we run uh, to run our tests, and then we'll run in a real browser, and we'll be able to see the interactions the user, the, the, our imaginary automated user takes. So the first thing it will do just before it runs the test is uh, actually run for a bunch of SQL statements to make sure it deletes any data that might be left over from previous test runs so that we have a clean state to start with. Uh, it's also handling uh, logging in the user and registering the user, but, what it's, uh, it, but instead of actually sending the emails and having to handle uh, real email addresses, it's just uh, that the back end is just writing to a database table alongside when it normally sends the email, uh, and it's writing into that database table the stuff it would normally have sent. Our tests obviously then have, ac have direct access to that same database, so they can read the information out um, and trigger a login. So it seems like a lot to sit and watch, but of course, you wouldn't normally watch your tests run. Normally, this is just something that happens in the background. You write it, and then you forget about it until your tests break. And at the point where your tests break, then you might go and watch the video of the run happening, uh, have a look at the, the logs, uh, and see if you can figure out what's broken. But on the whole, this is something, once you've got it running, you can forget about it. So. Um, some tips for writing good tests. Uh, one of the key things is how you identify the elements that you want to interact with. So my advice here is yes, WebDriver lets you select elements in a huge range of ways. So you can select them via CSS queries, which is kind of the easiest and the default. You can ask for them by ID or class name or so on, but then that's equivalent to just CSS queries. But you can also ask for them by what text is contained with them. So you can ask for a link that contains the text, click here, for example. Um, but the best way to do this, if you have control over both the application you're testing and you're writing the tests, is to, is to give unique IDs to each of the, the elements you want to interact with as part of the test. So I use data test ID. Uh, to differentiate it from any IDs that might be used in the actual code of the application. Um, it makes it easy then when you're reading the code to see that interacting, that, that that element is interacted with via an automated test. So then you know that if you make significant changes to the functionality of that part of the application, there'll be an automated test that you need to update as well. And it makes it easy to then find that automated test by just searching through the code of the, of the test for that data test ID. You don't want to rely on the position within the document, because if you do that, then every time the uh, structure of your application changes, even quite small amounts, you're going to be left with having your test broken. If you're using React, which is what I normally use, one of the other nice things about data test ID is it's easy to identify and strip out if you don't want to ship those IDs into production. Downside of this is then, you're not is then the code you're testing is not exactly the same as the code you're running. But on the other hand, it's very unlikely that having, uh, having a data test ID is going to be something you accidentally rely on in the code that you're writing. Uh, if you do want to do this, there's three different plugins that all seem to do exactly the same thing. Um, I haven't used any of them recently, so I can't say which is best. Uh, but all three of these uh, take React code and strip out any data test IDs before you ship to production. Um, all very similar names. I assume that all of them managed to somehow not find out about the other ones before writing them. Um, so next up, handling delays. So the one of the first things you'll come across uh, with writing end-to-end -end tests is that stuff doesn't happen instantly, even if it seems instant to the user. Because your end-to-end -end tests 
by default try and run as quickly as possible, they're going to click on things without pausing to take time to read them like a normal human would. What that can mean is that you try and click on elements that don't actually exist yet because that part of the page hasn't loaded or that form that you were submitting hasn't finished submitting yet. So you end up needing some way to have your tests pause and wait for a reasonable length of time like a human would. The natural instinct when doing this can be to just go, OK, so normally my form takes half a second to submit. If I add a two-second delay to my test, problem solved. There's a couple of key issues with this approach, though. The first is you're making every single test run you have two seconds slower, or rather one and a half seconds slower than it needs to be. The second issue is that then if that form for some reason takes 2.1 seconds to submit, suddenly you're going to be told that your test is failing. And you're going to have to go in and debug why it's failing. And the first thing you're probably going to end up doing is clicking that rerun the test button. And every time you click that, you're wasting half an hour of your own time. That should have been automated. That should have happened before you got involved. So the alternative, the much better alternative, is to poll until the condition is met. So if you, instead of adding an artificial delay, just keep checking in a, in a tight loop to see if the elements appeared that you want to interact with, to see if the form has finished submitting, then in the typical case, your test runs through that half a second form submit in roughly half a second. But in the worst case, where suddenly that form takes 2.1 seconds, you can still have your test run fine, because when we're talking about a timeout as opposed to a delay, we can make our timeouts much longer. So a timeout might suddenly be reasonable to have set at 10 or 20 or even 30 seconds, because, OK, we don't expect this to normally take anywhere near that long, but we probably don't want to alert all of our developers as if there's a major bug just because the system is running a bit slowly. I encourage you not to try and use end-to-end -end tests to monitor the performance of your application. There are much better tools out there to say that will tell you, is your application getting slower over time? Is it getting faster over time? Yes, it makes sense to keep an eye on, are my end-to-end -end tests as a whole getting slower or faster or better or worse? But it doesn't make sense to try and use timeouts in your end-to-end -end tests to enforce that your application is running quickly, because there's just too many things that affect the performance of end-to-end -end tests that might not be relevant to, uh, to real humans. You know, you're not necessarily looking at the average case. Sometimes you're going to be looking at the absolute worst case. Sometimes you're going to be looking at a really good case. Um, so these aren't the right place to test that. Cabby, the library I've been uh, using and developing, uh, does polling on most of its APIs by default. So for example, if you request an element and it doesn't exist, it will keep, trying, keep retrying to get that element until either it does exist or a timeout of a few seconds is reached. Um, it has separate APIs that don't have that. Uh, if you are trying to see if an element exists and you're not actually sure whether it exists, you can use a, a try get element, and then it will fail uh, more, more quickly. But by default, it does this retrying for you on, on most of the APIs. So handling complex elements is another thing that will come up quickly when you start to do end-to-end -end tests. So when I say complex elements, what I'm talking about are things where you haven't just used a straightforward input or a select element or a checkbox but instead you've used something like a custom select element that's actually built out of a collection of buttons and divs and floating panels and all sorts. At that point, it's easy to, to, to sort of decide to give up and go, OK, this is not worth interacting with in my end-to-end -end tests. I've checked this select component I've been using for ages definitely works. Um, it's fine to say, this little component is not worth testing individually because I trust the developers of this shared component that I'm using uh, to, have, to have made sure it works, and I don't want my test to be too brittle. 
But what you don't want to do is give up on testing and on running end-to-end -end tests altogether. You still want to check that your application behaves correctly. The easiest way to do this then is to try and take that component out and say, I don't want to test that bit. I just want to test that my uh, code interacts correctly with it. If you're using some kind of component system like React, like a modern, like the modern version of Angular, I believe as well then it usually has some really nice ways to do this. The example I'm going to give is in React, but the same principle should apply. So React components get given properties. So if you had, for example, a custom select element, it would be given a value property and an onChange property as its input. And React also provides lifecycle methods so you can have the component do something when it's mounted onto the page, do something when it's removed from the page. What this means is we can expose the properties we've been passed in, the value and the onChange handler, globally on the window object when the component gets mounted, and then strip those away again when the component is unmounted. Very important that we remember to remove them when the component is unmounted, otherwise we're going to have a memory leak. Um, and also very important that we only expose the ones that have a data test ID, have some kind of identifier that we, can, that we can use to interact with them. Having done that, how do we interact with that from the client side, or from our test, rather? How do, how do we use our, our WebDriver API to automate this? Well, the good thing about WebDriver is in addition to providing APIs for interacting with the document like a human would by clicking buttons and typing text, it also provides APIs for running JavaScript. So we can do uh, effectively a remote eval, which I'm sure your security teams will love as an idea, but in this context, it should be OK, uh, which lets you uh, refer to those global objects that you created before. Um, and you can, for example, read the value uh, or call uh, the onChange function with a different value. So earlier, the demo was just a video. I, I doubt I uh, fooled anyone into thinking it was me really live coding. Uh, but I thought I'd also, if there's time, squeeze in a little bit of a live demo as well. So I'm going to have a go at doing that now, uh, if everything works. Right. So uh, doo -doo -doo. okie dokie. So I have a little application, uh, not anywhere near as complicated as uh, the application in the demo I showed earlier. Uh, but this is a little application we can test um, that simply reverses a string. So if I type in info share and click reverse, that is info share backwards. And then I can tap reverse again, and it reverses it and comes back to info share. So not a, very, not a real world application, just a little thing for a fun demo. Um, so uh, here's the React code for that form. It handles change and submit um, and keeps track of the state of that, of that input. Uh, and then it renders a form with an input and a button. So there's two things on this page that we're going to want to interact with in our tests. We're going to want to interact with the input because I typed into the input, and we're going to want to interact with the button because I clicked the button. So if we give both of those a data test ID, uh, and I'll give the input a data test ID of value, uh, and I'll give the button a data test ID of reverse. Then I should be able to interact with these two elements nice and easily from my test. So in my test itself, I'm going to want to import an assertion library. Uh, Node includes a built-in assert library. And I'm also going to want to import cabby. And there's two versions of cabby. There's an async version and a synchronous version. I'm going to use the sync version just because it's much easier to use. Uh, the async version can give you better, much better performance, um, but it's a lot more effort to write the tests to be asynchronous. Uh, next up, I need to create the driver for the page. And that is. Uh, cabby, and then I select uh, what backend I want. So I can use Chrome Driver, TaxiRank, uh, Source Labs, uh, various options. 
uh, or even a custom uh, URI to just point to a given remote. Uh, I'll try taxi rank for now, uh, and hopefully we'll get time to also look at what Chrome driver looks like. I'm going to pass in some options. I'm going to set a base URL, which just then means that whenever I do any navigation, it'll be relative to this URL. Uh, and I'm also going to enable debugging, which will just print out all of the actions that get taken into the terminal. Uh, next up, I am going to take driver and navigate to uh, the root path of that base URL I already created. So that's just navigating. It's just loading the web page. Uh, and then I can get that input, because that's the first thing I in interacted with when I uh, was testing manually. Uh, yep, that's why that's not working. Um, and I can just use a CSS selector here. Uh, and it was value. And then to simulate uh, typing into the text box, I can just use value.send keys to type into that uh, input. And we'll type info share. Next up, let's just assert that that's worked. We'll check that that's worked. So we'll do assert, assert strict equal, and then we'll get the value that was in, val in that value input. Uh, attribute. And we're getting really good autocomplete here because I'm using TypeScript, and Cabby out has both type definitions for TypeScript and Flow. Uh, and then if we just do driver.dispose at the bottom, then we should be able to test this and check that it's running fine so far. I forgot what? Ah, yep, so it will. Yep. So uh, run the tests. And we can see uh, in the output there that it's saying that it uh, First navigated to the home page, got the uh, value element, then sent some keys to it, then got the attribute, which returned info share, then it disposed the driver. Uh, that's probably not very legible, is it? Nope. That should be slightly better. Is that readable from the back? Yep, good. OK. So uh, next up, I need to get that uh, button, which was the next thing I interacted with. Uh, and we gave it an ID of reverse. Then we need to click the, map, the button with the mouse, so button.mouse.click. And next up, we're going to want to just check that the value has been reversed. So we'll copy in that assert, but in this time, it is E-R-A-H, capital S, space O-F-N, capital I. And then if that all runs, then we're confident that our application works. So let's give it a go. All looked correct. So that was very uh, unimpressive, but we can also change this to Chrome driver. And then we should be able to run our tests in a real browser. So I'm just going to start Chrome driver in the background. And then I'll just move this into the bottom right under the screen. And if I minimize that and close that, then you should be able to see this run in Chrome driver. And although it was uh, the blink of an eye, Chrome driver did just fire up and uh, simulate a user typing in info share, clicking the reverse button, checking that the text really did contain info share reversed, and then close the browser again. So if, you're, yeah, if your back end is running reasonably fast, end-to-end -end tests don't necessarily need to be that slow. And and that's all I had. Thank you.